I hope everybody has their Bibles. If you don't have a Bible and you would like one, you just raise your hand and Connor is ready to go to dish out some Bibles. Otherwise, if you would join me, we made it to Deuteronomy 11. I thought we were going to develop some steam last week. We were going to do two chapters a week from here on out. Chapter 11 stopped that short burst of energy, I think. Chapter 11 is one of those. I think we had a conversation in the foyer. Chapter 11 is quickly becoming one of my favorite chapters. This is an awesome chapter. So chapter 11, it is, you know, relatively short. Um, it's going to break down this evening into three different parts. You'll notice where each break is with the phrase, therefore you shall. We're going to see that three times in this chapter. And largely what we're dealing with is a series of responses. Moses essentially is encouraging the Israelites into a proper response to the Lord. This should not shock us. Not the fact that Moses is trying to encourage and teach them about a proper response to the Lord, but do we not need the same instruction? Maybe not now so much. Some of us kind of got it. You know, when you meet someone and they're going to shake your hand, Stand up, shake their hand, pull a chair out for someone when they're going to sit down, whatever their proper response. You remember when we were kids? We have kids. A lot of us have young kids. And the thing that makes me nervous is like birthday parties, Christmas with other families, stuff like that. Because if there's anywhere that a series of bad responses is going to come out, it's in that situation. How many of us as a kid opens up the gift from like grandma and grandpa and they see the pants and where do they go? Right over the shoulder, they're looking for the next box, and you're the parent. You can always see them because you always get that one guy that thinks it's funny. So he elevates the camera and starts videotaping everybody else. You see the parents, like, whisper threatening their children. You grab those pants and you'll put them on right now. Like, we're used to that thing. It's important, these lessons, as it comes to responses. So for those of you that are note takers, really like to outline stuff, Section 1 is only going to be verse 1. Section 2 is verses 2 through 7. Section 3, no, I'm sorry. Section 1 is 1 through 7. <laughs> Section 2, so if you already wrote that in pen, my bad, just go ahead and scribble that out. Proper responses, right? Section 2 is verses 8 through 17, and section 3 is verses 18 and we're going to finish through the chapter. So we're going to be discussing these responses that Moses Moses teaching them these these proper responses to the Lord. It's what's really neat about this chapter. I love flow. Narrative is really easy generally to identify and to maintain maintain flow. All of these responses, these therefore you shalls that Moses is giving to the Israelites you're going to notice they're just going to kind of expound. They're going to kind of grow atop of one another throughout the course of the chapter. So chapter 11, Deuteronomy, I guess we should pray first. Let's do that. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the wonderful night that you have blessed us with. Lord, that we get together desiring to hear from you, to draw near to you, and hungry, Lord, for your word. So Lord, as we study, especially this section, please, Lord, let us do it with soft hearts that your word would penetrate to the, just the innermost of our being, and especially, Lord, that we would not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. We love you and pray in your name. Amen. All right, verse 1. Therefore, it's probably in my top 10 favorite Bible words. I always like therefore, because it reminds you to summarize what you have just read. So when he's giving this initial response, which is, you shall love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments always. So when you see that word, therefore, we always have to ask what question? What is it there for? Our response that he's getting at right here in verse 1 is what we have already gone through in chapters 9 and 10. For those of you who weren't here last week, we'll kind of briefly summarize chapters 9 and 10. Moses was basically, what he was getting at is, do not think too highly of yourselves because you're going into the promised land. It's not because of your righteousness or your positive attitude or your lack of bickering that you're going in to inherit the promised land. It has little to do with you and more to do with two things. One, the inhabitants of Canaan already 
were so wicked they're already marked for judgment. That one we have already studied. And number two, it's God's love and grace in him fulfilling the promise he made to their forefathers, the patriarchs, right? We remember that one beginning in Genesis chapter 12 with Abram. Those are the reasons they're being brought into the promised land. Those are great lessons for us because sometimes we think, oh, God's letting me do a thing. I must be that holy. Careful, because the Spirit's going to check you pretty fast if that's where, because, you know, pride is growing in that particular thing. So he's talking about how God is doing this thing. God is going to drive out the inhabitants. They're going to be brought alongside with the work. They're going to be the instrument that God is going to use to, to purge out the Canaanites, and he's going to preserve them in the land. So this is the proper response to a thing that the Lord is doing, to love the Lord and to obey his commandments. Deuteronomy, as we see in, as far as a response, being love and obedience to what God is doing, we see it 10 times alone in the book of Deuteronomy. So it's a proper response to his mercy, his grace, and his love. And that really shouldn't shock us. We remember in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, obey my commandments. This is probably the biggest thing, maybe a, a check for the church. How am I doing with Christ? What does my relationship look like with Christ? How obedient are we to his, his word? And then to expound on the concept of love the Lord, what does that mean? That we are choosing him for our most personal deepest and most intimate relationship. That also kind of shows us where we are with our walk with Christ. So verse 2, know today that I do not speak with your children who have not known and who have not seen the chastening of the Lord your God, his greatness and his mighty hand and his outstretched arm. Moses is now narrowing down <coughs> the group of people he's talking to. It's important, we'll expound on that particular point when we get to verse 7, but he's not talking to the young ones in the camp of Israel. <coughs> I got a thingy. Is that my water or your water? <laughs> smells like tacos, it must be mine. <clears throat> so he's narrowing it down a little bit, thank you, Tony. He's narrowing it down a little bit because the children of this particular generation they didn't experience any of that stuff yet. They may have caught some of the tail end of the 38 years of wandering. But you remember, this group that Moses is specifically addressing, this was the group that was 17 years old and younger 38 years ago. So those that were 17 years old 38 years ago, they're reaching up in their 50s. He's talking very specifically to them. And really what he's focusing on, that word for chastening, it's the education, education of his people. So this is kind of the focal point of group one, uh, or section one, I should say. God is taking his people to school. That word for chastening is educating. Sometimes we see, often when we're chasing our children, it's like, okay, well, there has to be punishment. But if they're strictly just punishment, are they going to grow out of that thing that got them in trouble to begin with? There should be like, a, like an education piece or more to the point that we have in verses 2 through 7. When God takes us through a hard thing and allows a hard thing, the problem that we have is we get focused on the hard thing. Lord, why are you doing this to me? And typically the next sentence that falls out of our lips is, I don't deserve this. Sometimes we do deserve. But more often than not, deserve has nothing to do with it. God is training us in a thing. And to make matters in a more secular verbiage worse for us, sometimes the thing that we're being trained through, it's not even for us. We learn that one in 2 Corinthians, right? Sometimes we were brought through that hard thing and we learn that hard thing. It's like, Lord, why did you do that? And then someone comes walking into your life or walking into the church like, oh, I've got this thing going on with me. He's like, oh, okay, I get it now. I know exactly what you're going through. This is what the Lord taught me. And you're able to minister 
and bear the burdens and help one come through that particular fire. So these are the lessons that the Israelites are going to learn in this school. And they're basically in two places for school. They're in Egypt, and they have their 38 years of wandering, and this is what they had learned. His signs and his acts, verse 3, which he did in the midst of Egypt to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to all his land. So that's the first aspect. He did it against Pharaoh and against all the land. You're remembering, or you should remember, <coughs> when we went through the book of Exodus together, that those serious plagues that affected all of the land of Egypt, and yet they did not affect the Israelites. Their crops weren't affected. Their cattle weren't affected. It shows that God knows how to punish the unjust while preserving his people. A huge lesson, especially as we continue to break down eschatology. The other thing that he did essentially to Pharaoh, it demonstrates that he alone is God and that there are no other gods. All of these plagues, you remember we went through the book of Exodus together. Egypt was polytheistic. They had a plethora of gods, over 100 gods, and we only identified roughly, what, 40 of them while we were studying through. Each of these plagues that was pronounced, those 10 plagues that were pronounced against Egypt, the land of Egypt, or the inhabitants of Egypt, was very specifically against the deities. It's like, oh, you worship the god of the Nile, which was, I don't even remember what his name was. So when the waters turned to blood and they couldn't undo it, it demonstrates God's superiority over all. And what he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses and their chariots, it shows that God can protect and preserve his people. How he made the waters of the Red Sea overflow, them as they pursued you, and how the Lord destroyed them to this day. It shows, it teaches that God can make a path where you do not see a path. We remember that path. I show up at the Red Sea and they're like, way to go, Moses. Your compass is broken or your GPS. I don't know what you're doing. Your map is upside down, but we're here. They're behind us. What are we supposed to do now? So they start praying. What was God's response? Why are you praying? Go forward. And God made a path where they would not think that there is a path. What he did for you in the wilderness until you came to this place. It shows God's provision. There was water from the rock. There was manna on the ground every day. There was quail that was essentially sent into the camp. So they got to learn about God's provision. Why all of these things? Because they're going into an uncertain land against an enemy that they know is a lot stronger than them. And they have to be able to sustain themselves in their land. So that's why they're being taken through these hard things. Moses, well, the Lord, the Lord is teaching them to rely on him and to trust in him for all things as they go into the land. Because that's what stopped them in the book of Numbers. They did not trust that God would be able to take them into the land and to protect them. You remember their final cry. Well, we can't go into land. Think of the children. When we all die in battle, the children are all going to be slaves. And God told them, okay, you're all going to die in the wilderness over the course of the next 38 years. Your children are going to be the ones that come in and inherit the land. And what he did to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab. This was Numbers chapter 16. We remember Numbers chapter 16. So we had Korah, who led the rebellion. Then we had Abiram and Dathan, um, that were Reubenites, firstborns. Go, uh, come alongside with Korah and lead both a spiritual or religious and a political coup against Moses and Aaron. And we remember Dathan and Abiram not showing up later and the earth opening up and swallowing all of them up. So they're the sons of Eliab, the son of Reuben, how the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up and their households, their tents, and all the substance that was in their possession in the midst of Israel. They're learning a lesson of rebellion because it brought a lack of unity into the camp. It was dividing the camp. If they're getting ready for a military campaign, which is exactly what they're doing again 38 years later, 
you cannot push forward in a military campaign if you have divided forces. So it taught the importance of unity. Verse 7, But your eyes have seen every great act of the Lord which he did. They had the experience, the ability, and thusly the responsibility to teach those things to the younger generations. This same challenge goes to us now. Those of us that are older and have been in our walk longer, we've been experiencing things of the Lord. We got a, a praise report this morning. Not this morning, this evening. Who's the morning person? Now you got me saying it. <laughs> this evening we got a praise report. We got to pray for someone um, about, about their neck, and the outcome of that was just exceptional. It, it's a God thing. We've learned those stuff. Some of you have been Christians for like, what, 40 years or better. The stuff you've experienced and the stuff that God has brought you through, you have that knowledge. My kids don't have that knowledge yet. Your kids or your grandkids, they don't have that knowledge yet. But because we have the experience, we then have the responsibility to be teaching that to the younger generations. Verse 8, this is section number 2. Therefore, with all of what we just learned, with all of the stuff that they just learned in their school, they're schooling in Egypt and they're schooling in the wilderness. Therefore, you shall, this is kind of the next expounding section, you shall keep every command which I command you today that you may be strong, that you may be strong and go in and possess the land which you cross over to possess, that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swore to give your fathers to them and their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. They should have learned that their reliance should be solely on the Lord. And number two, their ability to conquer and their ability to thrive has nothing to do with their military skill or their military prowess. It was all on their relationship to God and their response to God. Some of us are still trying to learn that lesson. When we see hard things coming our way, and I still... I still hear it, and it makes me chuckle every single time. Well, there's going to be a shortage on food. This one happened, was it last year? They're worried about some of the cargo ships, and there's going to be this great big shortage on food. And all I heard in our circles were, well, see, that's why it's a good thing that I have chickens. Or this is why I have such an exorbitant savings account. And I just kind of look at them. I feel bad for saying it, but I'm a pastor, so I feel like I can just get away with, with it. It's like, what you should be saying is at least I have Jesus. Like, where, where is your rock? Where is your foundation? Truly, where is your provision from? It's like, well, God gave me chickens. What are you going to do when he takes them? They need to learn that lesson. It's got less to do with their prowess and their skill. But it's their relationship and their reliance and their trust and their dependence upon the Lord. So the bottom of verse 9, to land flowing with milk and honey, for the land which you go to possess is not like the land of Egypt, from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot as a vegetable garden. But the land which you cross over to possess is a land of hills and valleys which drinks water from the rain of heaven, a land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. Why is Moses saying it again? I think for two reasons. Sometimes the longer we walk with Christ, we get kind of this jaded vision of what it is we have repented or turned away from, right? We've, we've kind of used those examples. Like for some people, it's like, oh, high school is the best years of my life. Or for me, in my ignorance sometimes, oh, my military service is the best years of my life. Then when you really start thinking about it, it's like, man, those years were terrible. I would not want to repeat that for anything. So now when people say, well, I'm going to join the military, what job should I pick? It's basically anything else besides the job that I pick because all of those memories really start kind of flooding back. The further they get from the land of Egypt, and we saw it in the book of Numbers, they start thinking of stuff. Do you remember the dates that were in Egypt and how good they were? Do you remember the fish? Now, they're in the middle of the desert for 38 years. They probably haven't seen a fish in 38 years. That would break my heart. <laughs> Do you just remember the food? It was so good. You know, we should go back into bondage. 
we should go back into Egypt because the food was just that good. It's interesting just how deterred we can be in our flesh. So Moses is reminding them, the land that's in front of you, the thing that's in front of you, same thing for the church, what's in front of us is way better than all of the stuff that's behind us. We need reminders just like this one because we haven't seen heaven. We have what they have. We have some descriptions. We have what we have through the prophets. We have some in the book of Revelation. But we, our eyes haven't laid hold of it yet. I'm almost certain that if we just got a 30-second snapshot, right? I have a mission trip coming up in August in Peru. So what did I do when I got home? I looked up two things. Cool stuff to do in Peru. And I am who I am. Surfing in Peru. Six minute videos. Now, those of you that know me best, you know I do not like leaving the country. I love my feet right here on American soil. I don't like leaving. I'm pretty excited. I watched roughly 12 minutes of footage. I'm ready to go to Peru. I can already tell you, it's not the rainforesty thing I thought it was. There's some desert over there. I'm excited to go to Peru. Can you imagine if you got 30 second visual of heaven? How solid would your walk be at that point? Oh my, that's where I'm going? There's streets of gold. We're going to have our own places. The tree of life is there. There's, there's water there. Water untainted by sin or the curse. What does that even look like? What does that taste like? How solid would your walk be at that point? They have about the same information that we have, except two spies, Caleb and Joshua from the book of Numbers, they have seen it, and they're still excited for it. 38 years later, they're still championing for their people to cross over into the promised land. 38 years while they were on a 40-day hike through the promised land. So that's the first one. We need those reminders. Number two, it's probably tethered to verse 6. Why is Dathan and Abiram even mentioning, even mentioned in, their, in this section, in this particular school phase? Because in chapter 16 of the book of Numbers, I don't remember what verse, somewhere around maybe 30, they said they were accusing Moses of taking them out of the land of milk and honey. They were calling Egypt the land of milk and honey. Egypt always being that biblical picture or that typology of bondage, of sin. He's saying, you know what? You already brought us out of the good thing, and now you're leading us into death. We had two apostates. We had two essentially bad leaders, three if you include Korah, trying to lead people back into bondage, saying what God has in front of you is rubbish. Where real life happens, that's the one that you left behind. So this is probably why Moses is giving that reminder. And it shall be, verse 13, that if you earnestly obey my commandments, I love that one. You're probably not going to be obedient on accident. Now, yeah, maybe it'll happen. We're just living that consistent life for Christ. But you notice the earnestly. It's going to require some effort on their part. Which I command you today to love the Lord your God, to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Then I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain that you may gather in your grain, your new wine, and your oil. We see blessings in obedience. Shocker. Too many Christians hitting their rough patch. It's like, well, the Lord's really not blessing the situation. Explain to me the situation. And it's, it's not a good one. It's like, do you really think God is going to curse your disobedience? You're expecting God to curse your, or to bless your sin. And when we put it that way, it's like, well, it's mercy. No. We see quite clearly the blessings in obedience. And the blessings in obedience is really describing the early season rain and the latter season rain. The early season rain for new seeds, new shoots, new beginnings, and the latter season rain to bring in the fullness of the, har the harvest, essentially saying that he is going to take care of them in the land. And I will send grass in your fields for your livestock that you may eat and be filled. Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you, and he shut up the heavens so that there be no rain, and the land yield no produce, and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. 
why is Moses taking this weird turn? We're talking about blessings and obedience, and we're talking about all of this agrarian or agricultural stuff, the growing of stuff, corn and beans and cotton and whatever other stuff they're growing over there. Why is he switching to idolatry? It's important to note that the majority of Canaanite pagan deities were fertility gods like Baal. So they would be tempted, right? Forgetting these lessons they learned in the school, they would be tempted to start worshiping some of these other deities to promote or to encourage or to ask these deities to give them a full harvest to come. Now, to us, that might not make sense. So let's change it to maybe a more modern vernacular. We have jobs. We have careers. And sometimes to make it in the job or the career or to make that money, sometimes we have to cut corners. Sometimes we have to cheat. Sometimes we have to lie. But within that field, it's always encouraged as being okay. That's just how it's done here. So now can you kind of see the, the correlation? We're going to do it a way that is not God's way so that this new way we are on is going to be blessed. God is warning them, don't do that. If you're going to worship these deities to promote a full harvest, you're going to end up not in the land, and the land is going to have a drought. We see two great examples of that one. 1 Kings chapter 17, idolatry brought drought. Remember that one. The prophet was against Ahab. He's like, you know, because of your worship of Baal, it's not going to rain for seven years. So Elijah, in his confrontation with um, Ahab about his idolatry, brought drought. In 722 B.C. and then in 587 B.C., first the northern territory went into captivity through Syria because of idolatry. And then in 587 B.C., the southern kingdom, Judah, went into captivity into Babylon because of their idolatry. So you will perish quickly from the good land, turning to, when you put your trust in something else, that's largely what it's boiling down to. You don't trust that God is going to see you through, so we start seeking a completely different means, typically a worldly one. So we have that warning. Verse 18, Therefore, you shall. This starts our third section. So with all of these things in mind, what God has done for you, verse 1, the stuff you learned in the desert, verse 2, sorry, in section 1, in section 2, you're learning and you're encouraged into all of God's provision, and that warning brings us into third, uh, the third section. This is how they should respond. This is how Moses is encouraging them to respond. Therefore, you shall lay up these words, or put up is probably a more literal rendering. You shall lay up these words of mine in your heart, in your soul, and bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, a constant reminder. And we discussed the frontlets the phylacteries, we discussed the boxes they wear on their hands or the ones they wear in between their eyes. Man, that's quite the reminder. What do we do to remind us of the Word of God? Sometimes we have little note cards. I have note cards in the back of my Bible that I write some of my memory verses on because every time I find a really cool verse, I write it on a note card and I put it in my Bible so I can consistently try and remember that one. I haven't looked at them in a week. In all transparency. Can you imagine having a little box on your hand? You're going to know it's there. Now imagine if that little box, the phylactery, and we had pictures of it. We don't this evening. If you can Google them. But they have this little black box right between their eyes. You're going to know it's there. It's not going to escape you. And they, have, they had passages in those boxes. What do we do? as a constant reminder or to help us to meditate on God's word. You shall teach them to your children. Again, the heavy duty is being ushered to the parents. This is not the first time we've seen this in the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Leviticus, we know the Levites were tasked to teaching the word of God to the people. But in the book of Deuteronomy, the emphasis is given to the parents to teach the word of God 
to their children. That's huge. We get your kids in this church for maybe three hours a week, if we're lucky. That's three hours in Bible time with the kiddos. Where are they getting the rest of their training? You say, well, we have school things. It's basically the government's raising your kids. And we've seen how that works out. It's our responsibility to do those things. The Sunday school teachers here, God bless them. They have a lot of work on their hands, and they, do, they are very diligent to do that work. But it's only three hours at best of work a week. The rest of it really should be on the parents. Speaking of them, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, and you shall write them on the doorposts, which is the mezuzah. Yeah, the mezuzah. We have one of those in my office. You guys want to see that one afterwards. Uh, write them on your doorposts of your house and your gates. The way to learn the word of God is the same way to learn a foreign language. Immersion. Proper instruction and immersion. You really have to have both, especially when you're a dum-dum like myself. I have taken co- two years of college-level Spanish. I've taken German, Arabic, Pashtu, Farsi, Dari at the college level. I can't speak a one of them. Maybe a couple of words because I've never immersed myself into the situation. And now we're going to Peru in a few months. Like, you know what? I'm going to learn Spanish in four months. I'm still trying to learn English. Some of us are like that in the Word. How many of us have been believers for 50 years? And key concepts of who we are, what we believe, and why we believe it have completely escaped us because we're refusing to be immersed. But instead, it's, well, I read my devotional every morning. Well, how much time are you getting in the meat? How much time are you getting in the Word? How many of the prophets, Jeremiah really comes to mind, it's like, I found your word, it was awesome, and I ate it. Obviously, that's kind of past the word wage paraphrase a little bit. But he just completely took it in. Full immersion is what is necessary. And before we get to a place of thinking, well, this is only for the Jews. I remind you of Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Why? Because we have sections in the Bible like 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, and I think 13 through 17. False teachers. Jack Deere said this, Commitment to know and obey the word keeps us from contemporary forms of false worship. We will fall for all manner of bad, false, and evil doctrine when we do not know our word. We have to pray every day, and we have to read our Bibles every day. Full immersion, as much as we can possibly get. So what Moses is getting at, verse 21, that your days and the days of your children might be multiplied in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them like the days of heavens above the earth. His word and obeying the word was the only way to survive. If the church's survival is dependent on our reading of the word now, the church's herd would be greatly thinned. Bible illiteracy is just at an all-time high. Full immersion. We need to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. For if you carefully keep all these commandments, which I command you to do, to love the Lord, your God, to walk in his ways, and to hold fast to them. It's important to notice the flow of chapter 21. Verse 21, sorry. Learn them, and then do them. Because if we learn them, and we don't do them, You're going to forget them. Then the Lord will drive out all these nations from before you, and you will dispossess greater and mightier nations than yourselves. Every place on which the sole of your foot tread shall be yours, from the wilderness of Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even to the western sea shall be your territory. I think that was roughly 300,000 square miles, and they occupy currently... When they did go in and conquer, they occupied 3,000 of it. So you can see just kind of the breadth of what it was that was going to be given to them. No man shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will put the dread of you and the fear of you upon the land where you tread, just as he has said to you. That's probably, it's up there, but that's one of the coolest passages in the Bible. You don't know what God has done ahead of you until you get there. 
Joshua 2, 9 comes to mind. We remember Joshua chapter 2, verse 9. Rahab hides the spies, and the spies are like, why are you helping us? It's like, we're all like deathly afraid of you guys. We're deathly afraid of your God. They're in Jericho. That's like the most fortified place ever. And these two spies are standing there like, are you, we have shovels and pitchforks. We still haven't figured out how we're going to get past your walls. You're afraid of us. It's like, oh, deathly afraid. I would wager to say, though it's not in the text, that God did the exact same thing 38 years ago while they were at Kadesh Barnea. You remember that southern staging area, and they were going to go from south to north into the promised land. But they deterred because they didn't know what God was doing ahead of them. We are the exact same way. Fear of the unknown stops us in our place and we start looking for a different direction. This is one of the coolest Bible passages because it means so much to me personally. For years, I was kicking and moaning and crying and complaining because it was on my heart to do full-time ministry. But I didn't want to be a burden to the fellowship and I didn't want to be a bum. I didn't want to be a pastor that had nothing to do. But it was really being pressed upon me that now is the time you need to be quitting your jobs. Like, Lord, we don't have the money. And there's not enough for me to do to justify me being a full-time pastor. So we prayed, and we said, you know what, we're going to do it. We had a little bit of squeeze at work. And as soon as I quit my job, the next day, two things happened. We ended up a part of a grant that gave us almost $50,000 a year. That's nuts. And that the day after I quit my job is when I found out that they were going to let me go into the prison. And now we have a 43-man Bible study in the prison as of last Sunday. And we've been so busy, I don't know how I had time to even work. But I wouldn't have been able to experience these blessings until I moved forward. Once you start moving forward, you start climbing up the ladder. Say, man, what's on top of my roof? Well, you're not going to know until you start climbing up the ladder. You start seeing on top of the roof. It's like, oh my goodness, that's where that wire goes. Or this is why I have that leak. Oh, I was looking for that kite. We, we have to move forward. When God is pressing something upon your heart and you're idle about it, it's a trust issue. Lord, if I really move forward, are you going to do this thing? The part about this passage that kills me is I felt that calling in my life much longer than two years ago. And I'm curious at this point, now all things in God's timing, but I'm curious at this point what I missed out on just because I wouldn't just go a couple more rungs up the ladder or just walk out into the water just a little bit deeper. God has done this work ahead of the Israelites, this, this amazing work. Anywho, verse 26. Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. We won't focus on the blessings and the curses just yet because we're going to revisit this thing um, towards the end of the book of Deuteronomy. The blessing... If you obey the commandments of the Lord, your God, which I command you today. How can we obey the commandments if we don't know them? Read your Bibles every day. And the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord, your God, but turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other gods which you have not known. You notice the difference between a curse and a blessing is all determined on their relationship and their response to God. Moses is laying, out, laying it out for them that simply. They are choosing whether or not they're going to be cursed or they're choosing whether or not they're going to be blessed. Now it shall be when the Lord your God, I love that one, when, not if, when the Lord your God has brought you into the land which you go to possess, that you shall put a blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. We're going to revisit those towards the end of Deuteronomy. Are they not on the other side of the Jordan, toward the setting sun, in the land of the Canaanites, who dwell on the plain opposite of Gilgal, beneath the terebinth trees of Moreh? For you will cross over the Jordan, and go in to possess the land, which the Lord your God is giving you, and you will possess it and dwell in it. And you shall be careful to observe all the statutes and judgments which I set before you today. There's right responses and there's wrong responses. I am so thankful for God's mercy and His grace, because I'm guessing we have a room full of wrong responsers. 
God has not given up on you. Your time is still now. You still have time to seek. You still have time to pursue. You still have time to walk with. You still have time to respond appropriately. Like, well, Pastor, what do I do to respond? Love God and obey his word. But I don't know what, what commandments. Start reading your Bibles. You're going to figure it out real fast, especially when you pray, because we should be reading our Bibles and praying every day. Lord, what do you have for me today? What do you want me to do? He's going to make it known to you. That is our response to the Lord. And we notice that all of these tears are designed for what? For the Israelites. To teach them to trust, to have faith, and to truly, to the, the innermost of their being, to fear the Lord. To live knowing that He is real, and He really sees them. And He is really going before them. Their blessing. This is probably the point that we're going to end on. There was blessing in going forward. In faith. There was not going to be blessing staying outside of the promised land. We saw what that amounted to at Kadesh Barnea 38 years before this transpired in the book of Numbers. That generation was removed, and the next generation was raised up to go into the promised land. God has the most amazing things for you. Some of you have callings on your hearts, like, I don't know if I can do it or if I should do it. I don't know if God, really what it boils down to, I don't know if God is going to take care of me if I do go forward. What happens if I fall backwards? If you don't move forward, you're basically always going to be on your back. The blessings are in front of you. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for the night and the time in your word. Lord, this is a challenging section because it causes us to remember the hard things that you brought us through. But we should take hope in it, knowing, God, that you didn't waste a moment of those hard things. We're, we have been the wasteful ones. But I pray, God, it's our lessons through those hard things that would stick with us. Lord, we're challenged to pursue you and do things your way in all things. We're challenged to trust you. And that one is heavy, Lord, especially as it seems like the grip of the economy is closing in everywhere. But Lord, you are seated on your throne forever. All things are in your hand. So I pray, God, that we would be just solidified in the fact, God, knowing that. And Lord, if you are for us, who can be against us? Thank you, Lord, for this evening. And we love you. And we pray in your holy name. Amen.